This is a Main Hustle Media Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Jackie O and you're listening to Militantly Mixed. Yo, this is Rashani from the Single Simulcast. And when I'm not making you laugh or making up parody songs, I'm kicking back listening to Militantly Mixed. I would like to acknowledge that the Militantly Mixed podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Chumash and the Tongva people, and I wish to pay my respects to the people of those nations, both past and present. Hey y'all, welcome to Militantly Mixed, the podcast about race and identity from a mixed race perspective. I am your host, Charmaine, aka Mixed Girl Maine. The busiest mixed race bisexual polyamorous atheist comic book nerd cat mom mask making Gulf Coast Cosmos comic book co owning Asian American Podcasters Association's Golden Crane Award winning podcaster in this podcasting game. This is episode 137, sorry, 137, and I can't really record an intro because I keep having coughing fits. I have a terrible sore throat. Um, it's just getting worse every time I try. So I'm just letting you know that the audio that you're going to hear today is the audio from the live stream that we did on May 16th through the Blasian March and hosted on the YouTube platform of Militantly Mixed for Black Asian Solidarity and the legacy of Yoriko Chiyama and Malcolm X. It was in honor of their shared birthday, which was May 19th, but we actually produced the live stream on May 16th. Uh, it is um, moderated, hosted by Rohan Jolie of the Blasia March with guest speaker Asian Soph from Mixed Present and myself. And um, there's a lot of magic in the room when the three of us get together to talk about Black Asian solidarity or anything in general, but we have a shared mission when it comes to Black Asian solidarity. Again, I can't really talk, it, it kind of hurts. So I just want to say, if you would like to watch the video, you can check out the YouTube channel for Militantly Mix. It is still there, but for those of you who access the show through the podcast exclusively, I didn't want you to miss out on the audio for it. Also, the proceeds from the Mixed and Hella Asian t-shirt that is available on MilitantlyMix.com right now, every purchase from the month of May and June, uh, the funds for those shirts will go towards the Blasian March um, in uh, routed towards them in support of all the work that they do, both in organizing the Blasian March itself or Blasian Marches themselves, but also for the work they do with black and brown trans youth, um, the Okra Project, which feeds uh, black and brown trans people in the New York area, um, and, and other various organizations. If you would like to support the Blasian March directly, you can go to Instagram and follow them on uh, uh, at Blasian March or Rohan Jolie um, at Diary of a Firebird on Instagram and connect with them directly in terms of how you would like to donate funds. But if you would also like to purchase a Mix and Hella Asian t-shirt, 100% of the profits of those shirts will go for the month of May and June will go towards the Blasian March. Um, profits from the shirts that were sold between March and April went towards Advancing Justice in Atlanta and um, every two months I will collect the, the profits for those shirts. And at the end of the two months, I will send it to another organization that supports uh, Asian Americans and people of Asian descent in the United States. So if you would like to pick up one of those shirts, please go to militantlymix.com, click on the merch tab, and you'll find the shirts there. I have so much that I wanna say on this intro, but I really, I've tried multiple times to record this and it's a disaster every time. And it's just getting worse as my voice becomes more labored. So without further ado, <laughs> please join me in welcoming back our cousins, Rohan Jolie and Asian Soph to the Militantly Mixed family. Well, I guess they're cousins. They're already cousins. Um, but welcome them back to the show with the audio from our live stream from May 16th, Black Asian Solidarity and the Legacy of Yuri Kochiyama and Malcolm X.
Oh, hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Look, it's just me laughing. <laughs> it was the inhale for me. It was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are live. This is great. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. Thanks and welcome to our special panel event celebrating the uh, joint birthdays of Yori Kochiyama and Malcolm X. Um, this is an amazing collaboration. Uh, with No Telling Mixed and the Blasian March. So, yay. yay! And I, you know what? Let's just say it's a, also a collaboration with Mixed Present. Why not? Sure. <laughs> I mean, I think no, at this just... point that we're like a little trinity of... We are. <laughs> Blasian, Black Asian Solidarity. We're, we're going to be... The if it's going to be trinity. Black Asian and Solidarity, it's going to be the three of us, so... The Mixed Asian Trinity. I love it. There we are. I'm taking, I'm, I'm putting that on a t-shirt. We're, we're going yes. to get t-shirts made. <laughs> maybe, maybe like a, a drawing one. I have this shirt from the Asian American Girl Club. It's got oh, Beauty nice. and Malcolm on it. And it's like, yes. the proceeds from this, when they were selling it, went to Black Lives Matter. Okay. Um, Love it. Yeah, I got it last year. So shout out to the Asian American Girl Club. Really yes. Great. Come on, Thanks. Asian girl power. Yes. <laughs> All of that. <laughs> Well, I guess um, to start, uh, my name is Rohan. I am the founder of the Blasian March. My pronouns are they, xia, and da. Um, I'm coming to you from the occupied territory of the Lenape people, aka New York City. Um, I'm wearing a gray hoodie. My skin is this luscious, lovely, <laughs> black, gold, brown complexion. You don't know. Uh, I'm wearing a dark blue shirt. And behind me is a rainbow pride, rainbow pride flag, um, but it has the black and brown stripes uh, to acknowledge the queer black and brown folks and trans black and brown folks. So yeah, y'all want to introduce yourselves next? <laughs> All right. Yeah. I am Charmaine, a.k.a. Mixed Girl Maine, host of the Militantly Mixed podcast. And both Asian Sof and I are, are sitting on the lands that were formerly the Chumash and the Tongva people, since we're out here in the L.A. area. Um, I'm wearing a dark gray Militantly Mixed logo shirt, um, and I've got white headphones and my uh, my hair growth since the last time you all saw me. I got a little bit of growth oh, now. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I was going to put a head wrap because it's still awkward, but we all right. With the it looks great. <laughs> I love it. Um, and while I am not as lusciously colored at the moment, I, I got tan forehead and mask paleness underneath. Uh, the struggle is real for us. So lighter <laughs> Asians right now sir you were you were born luscious <laughs> thank you you also forgot to tell the world your pronouns oh my pronouns are she they and my honorifics are sir and mix <laughs> sir sir <laughs> i do i i prefer a masculine uh, honorific for show we love it <laughs> you know um, I'm Asian Soph. Uh, I, um, she already said on whose land we are at. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I have this like brown hair going on. I am <laughs> light, uh, lighter colored East Asian. Um, and I have a gray t-shirt that has Yudu Kochiyama and Malcolm X on it. Hey. hey, we're all here. Okay, so I guess to kick things off, I would just love to send Tress and Grass. Since we're talking about these two amazing. Oh, I burped. Wow, sorry. I... <laughs> this is a very casual conversation. I'm very glad it's casual. Oh my goodness. I mean, again, we're the three of us. We're. we're... <laughs> We're going to be fine. I know. I'm trying to be all formal, like, oh, welcome. I was like, I just burped, like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess then first things, since we are talking about these two amazing legends, um, I just want to know for both of you, um, what, 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 what do they mean to you? Who were Malcolm X and Yuri Kochama to the both of you? Uh, Sir Maine, you can start. <laughs> um, well, I have to be honest with Yori Kochiyama. I, that's a recent learn for me. I don't know how she mi I miss her in all of my studies and things like that for, that's for white so supremacy long. supremacy at work. It's white supremacy I mean, yes, absolutely. And and it, but I will. Um, but in the time that I have been uh, researching and look looking at like watching videos of this woman and being just so surprised, like it's it's 
unwriting everything that that um, being taught about the presentation of Japanese women in America and things like that. So I um, I will say that she means a lot to me now, but it's a recent it's a recent mm-hmm. learn and it's a little bit uh, a bit of shame for me. But I I got the book Heartbeat of a Struggle right here. I'm I'm getting through it. I'm trying. It's hard. It's not on audiobook, and I usually read audio now because of how busy I am. Uh, but I'm gonna get there. Uh, but Malcolm <laughs> Malcolm X is somebody that I'm I'm far more um, connected to and grounded to in my in my early days of racial militancy as I was you know. 13 14 you know i got posters of angela davis on my wall and things like that i you know i went through in the early 90s there was sort of this resurgence of bringing back the teachings of malcolm x you know this pre-internet and people trying to to figure out who he was at, at, at my age group at the time and um and so i had read his autobiography at that at that time i i had been like sort of closetly militant because my dad wasn't really super comfortable with the, with that kind of blackness that I was, um, adopting, I guess, not adopting. I was just in it. I would, it was the neighborhood I was in. It was the people I was around and everything like that. So, and of course uh, the Spike Lee movie came out around the time that I was at that critical point of which way am I going to go in my blackness and the stuff that as part from the religion, because I'm not religious, um, a lot of the stuff that he was talking about spoke directly to the exact neighborhood I was in, the the change that had not happened even after all these years um, between his death and, and my teenage years. Um, I felt as angry and fiery as I felt he was. And so um, there, I will say there's been more meaning to me for Malcolm X throughout my entire life, whereas now the two of them together um, are starting to like, change and name some of the stuff that I that I thought before I would say for me um oh also thank you for sharing that um uh I think that it's really cool to kind of see uh how you know there's always more people that you seem to learn about and I find that you know I I know it's not just you it's a ton of people are so late with finding out about Asian activists in the first place because it doesn't serve white supremacy to know that we have also you know been in this fight and it's not just been black folks you know it's been lots of minority groups actually and if there's unity and there's that inspiration like it de- directly works against white supremacy but um for me both of these people were symbols that it's never Never too late to learn to shift your beliefs to activate and to be impactful because um you know we talk about yuri kochiyama and how you know truly impactful she was and like how big she was in the movement but she was very apolitical for most of her life she didn't meet malcolm x until october 16th 1963 she was 42 years old malcolm was what 38 um because i believe he's four years younger than her um And, you know, and she and her son, Billy, had been arrested with 600 other core protesters in New York because they were protesting for um, Puerto Ricans and blacks to have more uh, construction working jobs. And so Malcolm X showed up and at the court case at the at the courthouse. And that was when she got to meet him for the first time. And, you know, obviously he was naturally very like, who are you and why do you want to shake my hand? And she was like, you know, she had she describes the interaction is so awkward, but she was very apolitical for a while, even when her families were, when her family and she were interned at the concentration camps um, for being Japanese, you know? And with the same thing with Malcolm, I mean, we saw, he, luckily we can kind of see like his life marked in stages where he had different names, you know, Malcolm Little, Detroit Red. Um, I feel like I'm going to say his uh, Nation of Islam name incorrectly, but El Haj Malik El Shabazz and then Malcolm X. So we see these different, um, we see his life marked in different ways. And I think with Yuri, Yuri, uh, we saw a kind of a similar thing, um, too, as well. So I think it's cool to know that you can always change your stances. You can always educate, you can always, you know, still be impactful no matter what, you know, everyone can always start anew as long as you're learning, you know, that's what they mean to me. I love that. Um, like I feel like definitely, Charmaine for me as well. Like Kochiyama is also for myself, um, relatively recent discovery. Like I definitely 
Well, for me, like I grew up in the South, so we were taught a very specific uh, misinterpretation of Malcolm X. <laughs> like for us, like we were taught that like he and the Black Panther Party and all the other uh, storylines that could not be whitewashed for like terrorist threats to the country when, you know, in actuality, it's just like, no, us fighting to survive and, and thrive and be valued as human beings is a, is a threat to white supremacy. So, mm. uh, side note, I'm trying to eradicate the word, the phrase white supremacy from my head because I just feel like I should not associate anything white with anything supreme, but it's a process. I, I feel that. I feel that. Right. <laughs> You're so mm. conscious about language and I like I'm like here for it because I you know you really don't think about like oh yeah like how colonized language is especially. So um mm. I applaud that about you actually a lot. <laughs> oh, thanks. And that being said, it's still a long-term process and like right. Right. And even just like the fact that like, again, you, you mentioned it earlier, Soph and, and Charmaine about like, we didn't even know about Yuri Kochiyama and like all of the other, you know, amazing Asian American freedom fighters. And that deals so much with like the intentional erasure of our stories, which keeps us as Asian Americans, you know, narrative wise kind of lost. And to the point at which it's just like, what? Anyhow. You, you start to wonder, like, especially now, I'm, I'm the oldest of all three of us, right? I'm 43. Um, I start to look back and I and I, I try to figure out, like, what were the points at which I could have had access to this information? And maybe did. Maybe I've seen her in things. Maybe I heard her in things and just disregarded it. Um, I know the, the picture of her, like, holding the... Um, the little speaker that's attached to one of those big speaker like things. The radio she, speaker thing? Yeah, the radio speaker. She has the head wrap on. I've seen that picture a bunch of times and never knowing who it was. And now that I associate with that picture with her, I'm like, oh, my gosh. So it's not that she hasn't been in my view in any way, shape or form. It's just that connecting a, a, an actual, not only just an Asian American activist, but specific, specifically a Japanese American activist, given that I... I'm also of Japanese ancestry. I, um, I, I like, I'm half angry that I didn't have access to it, but also it's like as typical as it could possibly be because we also come from a culture. I mean, Asian self and I are both Japanese. Um, we come from the kind of Asians that assimilate and don't talk about shit when you get here. So of course my people weren't going to inform me about her if they even knew about her. Um, and my whole access point to racial and social justice is entirely through my black upbringing, my black hood upbringing. And so the people that I assigned to and the people that I followed, like literally while people had posters of people they were attracted to on their walls as teenagers, I had Angela Davis, like she was mine, you know, like she was mine. And even I remember in my thirties learning about Kathleen Cleaver and she like, as a black Panther, she was as light as they come. And she was, you know, practically blonde, you know? And then I'm like, how did I never know about her until I was in my thirties? And then I start to read back and I'm like, Oh, actually I did know about her. I just didn't know who I knew about because I was reading books and not looking at pictures. I am pre-internet, you know, I'm a full ass adult by the time I get the internet. So my access point to a lot of the things I know about any kind of racial and social justice activism is entirely in black and white. It's, it's in reading books. And, um, so like I, I, I sit here and I want to get into it and I'm just like, you know what? I, I was almost ashamed coming into this, knowing that I was going to have to admit how late in life I came to the knowledge of Yuri Kushama. Like really had to like prime myself to be like, OK, just tell the truth. You didn't know. And now, like, I know a little bit, you know, <laughs> But, you know, a lot of people don't know about, you know, like, like I said, like white supremacy is doing its job right now, you know, and that that's what it is. And um, I feel like you're always coming into these, by the way, um, with like, I feel so guilty because I didn't. <laughs> I, I'm constantly like readapting things and I'm but I'm vocal about it through the whole process, which is probably <laughs> worse. Like I should just come out and be like, I am finally educated in this space. But no, I'm always like going through it live on recording and so that's real before. though <laughs> that's real and like it's a great um 
showcase about how literally all of us are radically learning and unlearning. You know? I think also when you talk about the transitional periods that you're in or the learning periods that you're in, what's important about doing that, if you're a person that like, you know, the three of us are in the public eye in mixed spaces right now. So if people who follow us are listening and they see us struggle or they see us in the learning process, it makes it more accessible for them because there's a lot of people that just don't try because they think it's too late or because they think like, who am I of all people to try this thing? Well, the yeah. three of us are all, all those people, right? At one point we had to decide to start being public about the things that we are passionate about, about the things that we're important about or that are important to us. And so to, to do it publicly as much as it sucks, <laughs> As much as it can suck, I feel All there's of our a, eyes right now. You know, like we're just like, oh, uh-huh, like there's some moments. I'm like, like triggers. You listen to old episodes of the military mix, and I'm like, woof, I was not there yet, you know. Um, but to get there and be, you know, do it now, I think our audiences will learn, you know. I mean, I didn't even realize that until until you said it, uh, Soph, about Yuri only coming to. Uh, that kind of political activism in her forties. Uh, she's, I'm a year younger than she was when she was really getting at it. So what do it. Like, I mean, I don't want to say that she, like she was really starting to shift. Like when she met Malcolm, she started to shift, but she had always been really politically active and um, it was very gradual. I mean, but she was always involved in the community and Mm -hmm. she had racist things happen to her. Like there was one time she was putting up posters for this like alumni organization, like dinner dance thing at a local like hamburger hut in San Pedro where she's from. Mm -hmm. And the police, this was like, you know, fresh during World War II. The police are, were like, why are you putting these posters up? Oh, we're going to be confiscating these. You need to come to the station with us. She could be signaling mm-hmm. Japanese. And she said there was so many people. She was well-respected in the community. She was very involved. She taught like Sunday school. Sunday school, yeah. Um, yeah, and she was, she did so much community organizing. She was popular and her whole family was kind of like this and kind of just knew everybody. And she said, no one said anything. No one stood up for her. She said, Mm -hmm. lots of my students were there, like families, like nobody said anything. And, you know, she said at the time she didn't really think about it, but reflecting on it, she was like, nobody, they just let me go. And then she get, thankfully like the, the, uh, when she got to the station, um, I forget what position it was, but like the main officer or whatever was like, oh, I know her and you just totally wasted her time. Like, why did you bring her here? And thankfully, but at still, least, I mean, at least happen. something <laughs> like that, given yeah, what was about like, to happen to her. <laughs> she was like, they're like alumni organization. It's a dinner dance. Like, I don't, you know, it was just so ridiculous. But the and- signaling thing is really interesting because I, I feel like more so in what I've been learning more so is is the what happens to her father right is is like you know he he donates money to japanese military just be you know and probably as a casual thought of like you know yeah i'm japanese and why not i'll give a little bit of money to some people that are hurting and that comes back to haunt him in a way that is going to end his life. You know, whatever, whatever we want to, whatever they want to say, he came back from surgery and then they put him in incarceration. And because they weren't giving him the medical care he need, he died probably a lot quicker than he would have had that not happened to him. So I'm really affected by that kind of stuff of like just random little yeah. conversations his father would have had, or her father would have had ends up being the things that um, convict him in their eyes leading into their incarceration. Yeah. And it's worth noting, they arrested fishermen. They arrested Mm -hmm. Shinto and Buddhist priests. They arrested Mm -hmm. language teachers. They arrested anybody who could have had any ties with Japan. Within the first 24 hours, they arrested over 700 men. Within the first 48, after the bombing in Pearl Harbor, they arrested over 1,300 and like there was never any like clear reason or indication given as to why. Um, but yeah, she, um, his, her father had just come home from a, the hospital and the FBI agents came to their house, told him to put on his robe and slippers and took him away. And not and even the dignity didn't even of tell them where they were going, you know, not even the dignity of that, just straight up. I'm going to put you in a robe and you're coming with us. 
and you're obviously hurting from from um, surgery. Uh, and I think you can equate to a lot of what was happening at that time, very similar to what was ha- what had happened with the the communist hunt that they do, they do. Right. It's all because your name is on a piece of paper somewhere related or unrelated, but it's it's telling the powers that be that you're at risk. Someone randomly goes into a communist meeting because they're just curious. They're like, well, I don't know anything about communism. I'm going to come in for whatever dumb reason. They sign their name on something. And then 10 years later, they get, you know what I'm saying? Like 10 years later, they get picked up and now they're part of the, the McCarthy hearings. Um, for yeah. The, for- yeah. And I was going to say um, the also during this time, right. President Roosevelt has access to military reports that say the Japanese Americans pose no threat domestically. And this was still done. So. Well, everyone is tuning in. You you just had, you just had a a history lesson. So, uh, (laughs) wow. Um, And, it's just so interesting that y'all, you two, bring this up, and I just can't help but think about the number of just parallels um, with systemic neglect that all of our communities of color are experiencing right now. Um, you know, with the pandemic, and um, uh, it's just it's it's frustrating to know that there is this consistent neglect or consistent abuse of communities of color. And um, yeah, um, so I guess I want to just bring us back and um, to the next question at hand. I'm just so curious, since both of you are doing like so much uh, for the community, um, Charmaine, you're doing a lot of like amplifying work and storytelling with the podcast. So if you're doing so much, uh, last I checked, mutual aid and stuff, I'm just curious, like, in your personal lives or like in your work, how much have these two like really inspired your work and your daily living? Um, For me with, with, uh, and I'll go back to, to Malcolm. Um, I, I have this, I thought I, I, wrote this down because I wanted to share it with the two of you Um, and thinking about like my early activist point of me, of me going more towards a radicalized view of racial justice. um, When I was 13 or 14 years old, I remember reading um, the autobiography of Malcolm X and at one point going, knowing that his mother was possibly mostly white, given that she was from Grenada and her mother was, um, raped by a white man and things like that. Um, and how light Malcolm was, I, I would sit there and I remember having this memory of going, I wonder if he would hate me because I'm lighter than him. Like that I'm trying, that I'm trying to own my blackness looking the way that I look and not have like, this is a 14 year old brain of trying to figure out like, would I be able to be involved with the kind of activism that Malcolm was involved towards the end of his life. Cause of course, once he separates from the nation of Islam and starts his own, um, the, is it, um, mosque, uh, Muslim mosque incorporated, uh, when he starts that and he starts t- changing his phrasing, right? Like we talked about change just a little bit ago. He talked, he, he talks about, you know, there was one point when I was closed off to any people from the outside, but then he does his, his pilgrimage to um, Mecca and he comes back and he's like, now I realize that people of all colors can be involved in this. And he starts to change his, 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 um, what he thinks is the way to do this work. And that's the Malcolm that I can, I attach to, right. It's for me, it's less about the, the religious aspects of it, but, but the understanding that like, we're not going to get anything done if we don't get things done across all of the communities we we need to all be buy in on this to make this work and i and i would sit there and i go that you know that's the malcolm that makes sense to me that's the the malcolm that i that you know makes me wear the x t-shirt and all that other kind of stuff i was doing when i was that age but i was always afraid and it's a weird kind of fear i was 14 year old afraid that malcolm wouldn't like me because I was like too mixed. I can relate to that though. I can totally relate to that. <laughs> it is such a weird thing to even think about. Like why even is that important? But I have this very vivid memory of being 14 and being worried that I wouldn't be the right kind of uh, radical or the right kind of militant for for him um, if I was in his time. You know, my, mind you, he's, he's dead long, uh, about 15 years or so before I'm born, but uh, he was that, imp- he was that impactful 
in just my reading of what he's done, what he said, his own words or listening to speeches or whatever, that I had concerns in 1992. I'm sitting here worried I wouldn't be enough for him. <laughs> so when I talk about like being influenced by somebody that that's what I'm talking about. Like I'm talking about having like real visceral reactions to wanting to do work that I that I hoped he would value when he was long dead. And it's weird, <laughs> weird that I felt that way. I totally don't think that is weird because I, you definitely hope that the people that you, that, that you're inspired by, um, that you, I mean, I don't know. Like, I would like to think that Yudi would have liked me. You know what I mean? I would have liked to think that she would have invited me to some of her Saturday meetings. Um, right. Or let you sleep on her couch and give you her key like she did. Well, with- I mean, she let everybody stay at her house all the time. Please. So. But, you know, be, like learning about her and how she just became so influential within the community. Like a lot of people knew her by reputation. And what was significant to me in learning about her um, and how she came to be close with Malcolm X and a lot of his associates and stuff and how they respected her. She didn't go into places and try to out know or out educate or out black folks. Like she was there to just like listen and learn and be there. And she even went to, I believe it was called the liberation school in Harlem, um, which was, you know, mostly black folks. And she just really tried to broaden her horizons. And, um, a quote that she has that I love, um, it has to do with Malcolm, but she said, one of the greatest lessons Malcolm taught people was to learn their own history know your history, know the world, be proud of who you are. He would say, if you don't know who you are and where you came from, how can you know what direction to go in the future? And I think it's what I really love about the fact that, you know, she was apolitical and then she slowly transitioned even after so much ha- clearly racist things had happened to her. Um, and she even uh, told him, you know, I disagree with you on your on his standpoint around integration, she actually transitioned by the time he was assassinated. She had gone from believing in integration and nonviolence to believing in self-determination and self-defense, you know, the similar messaging that he had as well. Um, and she continued to, um, you know, carry on with, uh, the networking. And that's like how I choose that's, that's along the lines of how I want to, you know, continue my sort of activism is, you know, that networking and introducing. And that's what she very much did. She would often link people together. She would let people host meetings at her apartment. She would invite people to come speak. I mean, um, there were these um, women, I believe, that had been um, in they were, you know, they were from Hiroshima, I believe, and they had physical scars from the bombs and stuff. And um, they came and all they wanted to do was meet Malcolm X, actually. And so he came to her apartment and like introduced themselves and like spoke with them and, you know, spoke with everybody there. There was all different kinds of, you know, there was black activists, there was white activists, there was all different people at her apartment. And just to hear him speak and to get a chance to meet him. And she said he carried himself with this just like charisma. And I mean, just to even have those kind of experiences, I think are really cool. Um, But I also think what was exciting is she was also really humble, but she also knew her limits in a lot of ways, which is admirable. Um, Cause she was asked to be like in organizations and she would be like, well, you can use my apartment or I'll attend some meetings and stuff, but she would never like, she was, I mean, according to, I believe Max Stanford was his name. He was one of the founders of um, Ram uh, which would become the Ram uh, Black Panthers in Harlem. Like she, he said that she was like instrumental in the formation of the Harlem chapter actually. Cause he met her on a bus going to DC in a demonstration <laughs> and she like knew who, who he was, but she, she had never met him before. And he was like, I knew her from reputation and mm-hmm. they linked and she network, she get, introduced him to a lot of people and he used her for a lot of like contacts and things like that. But I mean, just like that kind of thing is like so inspiring to me, like how connected and how well respected, well respected she was and that she didn't go into spaces and like, you know, I find a lot of people want to go in and just, I want to prove to you how much I know and how down I am. And like, that just wasn't her MO. And I think that that's dope. 
and you can I still think, be impactful but not be the loudest voice in the room all the time. Yeah. And I think you, uh, you and I have had conversations like that too. And, and to now remembering what the question was when we got started, um, the way that I think I try to approach um, the show and, and some of the things I do, you know, me describing myself as an amplifier versus an activist is, is um, I know what I know. Um, but I know that if I have something in, in more of an, an, um, an actual activism foot on the ground um, thing, I need to talk to somebody. I might need to talk to you. I might, or either of you, I might need to go to one of you and be like, Hey, blah, 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 blah. I'm not that person. Um, but the, but I use my platform to amplify other voices. And in doing that, I think I am, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by, by that idea of like, being a vessel. I think that's what you do with, with, with how we talk about with Yuri, right? She's a vessel for this information to get out to the people that it needs to get out to. She was literally willing to put up her own home if it meant that people were going to get this knowledge, if they, you know, if people are going to have access to this, if people are going to have a place where they could do the work that they needed to do. And I want to I want to believe that there's something like that in my space that I create too for the people that I get involved in. Um, I want to be able to use that space to be a vessel for the things that I'm not the expert in or that I don't know enough about, but I care enough about for it to get out. Um, so I think that that would be a way that that she could be an inspiration to the way that I do my work or um, but also just like the time period that these people are active you would almost say there's no business for them to be doing what they're doing given the climate that they were existing in and they did it anyway and i want to know that i have courage like that you know like i i want to know that i stand up in a time that i got no business doing it and that's what i think is the most influential thing about both of these people or anybody that put themselves up like that is that in, in terms of white supremacy or the white lens, they got no business, but they were like, oh, it is all my business. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Um, and I, I also just love that this is the space where you get to talk about this sort of thing. Cause it really just, it just like, it really affirms like what, what Sophie, you were talking about, um, Charmaine, you're talking about the fact that, both of them over time changed, evolved, reassessed. Um, and that's such a beautiful part of our experience the fact that we can still like keep doing this work, but also evolve as human beings as we do it. I mean, the fact that like, <clears throat> I mean, for me, Charmaine, a few months ago, I met you because you came reach out to me to do this podcast. I was like, oh, okay, this sounds so much fun. And like now here we are, I don't know how many months later and things are just We're go-tos. Exploded. We're go-tos for each other. Which is, yeah. Like, and I find that really affirming in the sense that like, you know, Malcolm X, his values changed, evolved over time. Coach Yama's values changed and evolved over time. And I just think that's just so great that we can like evolve and still have conversation and still move together. And like Coach Yama's doing networking and we lost Sof. And <laughs> uh, but that, and that, that to me has just been such a beautiful part of, of the work, just watching us all just like really flower as we do this stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm well, sorry. I exited out of the broadcast. But I, missed, I was so moved. <laughs> sorry. She was so moved. She moved out. It was great. I saw your finger go and I was like, what's about to happen? And then you just. <laughs> <laughs> Thanos snap. What happened? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you know, I think that that's the thing is I, th I think a lot of people get really, um, find activism and speaking out and getting involved with politics or things like that very daunting because I think people don't realize that all of us go through a journey and what we know like I didn't come out of the womb this way you know what I mean I have done a lot <laughs> exactly I came out of the womb like this let's go just came out of the fist up like let's go we got work to do go. let's do it <laughs> 
but you know, you know, like, uh, like you, you learn through time and like you get activated in various ways. And I, I mean, for, I'm, I was lucky to be able to have this conversation with you, um, Charmaine, but like, I got activated a lot through hip hop and coming to that, um, and, you know, a lot of times you don't know why or how, if you don't understand yourself, it's hard to kind of put the, like, why am I feeling this? Like, like why am I drawn to this? And you kind of just keep going until you have the words, or if you're, you know, like me and you go to therapy and you, you know, learn to identify things within yourself. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, like, I think a lot of people just think that, oh, okay, like I have to know all these things before I should speak out. And it's like, you're never going to know everything you know what I mean? And you you just get started with it. And just to know that like, even people who are as iconic as these two figures that we're talking about, they didn't, they came to it in a very specific way and they came to it when they needed to, you know, and, you know, had Malcolm not been so, you know, had been, had he not been brutally assassinated, he could have maybe changed his views again. Like, I mean, he had, he was, I mean, staunchly i guess people would have perceived that he was staunchly against white folks you know um and you know maybe not as dramatically as it was made out to be like like he didn't hate white people but i think he just didn't want anything from them or expect anything from them in the in in the time but then you know when he did does his pilgrimage and he's traveling internationally and he's um trying to uh he has these meetings with these african leaders um to start doing sort of a look into how uh african americans are treated in the united states um and trying to garner you know respect for his memorandum and stuff like he he really started to take on that internationalist sort of approach and believed that, um, you know, the solution could be an international one. And, 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 uh, when he met white Muslims on his pilgrimage to Mecca, right. That's where he really started to be like, Oh, okay. So like almost like a, let me, let me decolonize my thoughts sort of thing. I feel like, and, um, that's when he really started to change his approach. And I think that that's really cool that you can still do that. Like, and it's not, and you can explain yourself and all of that. Um, But yeah, I don't know where to, where to go. (laughs) Yeah. It just happened to me too, where I just get, I get just like, Oh, someone jump in. I love it. I love it. (laughs) So um, I guess from all of that, you know, we've been talking a lot about our own personal experiences, what we go through on the ground, off the ground. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, how how do we keep this legacy going? How do we keep this this conversation of um, evolution, solidarity, the evolution of solidarity? What can solidarity look like over time? How do we keep that going in our collective work, you know? So I I like to use the term press record as the thing that I explain of like me deciding to jump up and finally doing the podcast that I did. Right. You know, I wanted to talk about mixed issues. I wanted to find my place because of how much I had changed. I used to be black and then I moved out of my neighborhood and I became mixed because people didn't see me as black. And so that re- um, you know, reconfigured how I maneuvered and things like that. And then I moved to a different area and I adjust more de- of who I am or how I behave, depending on where, where I'm at. And by the time I, I decided to finally press record, that idea of pressing record was was making the step towards fill in the blank, right? It was, do this is an active thing and you can't keep thinking about it. You got to eventually do something. If you, Because if you... I felt so dissatisfied. And the reason why I felt so dissatisfied is because I was talking and thinking about this stuff, but I wasn't acting on the stuff that I wanted to do. I think when it comes, so I use press record as as the way that I'm kind of explaining that. In terms of uh, solidarity movements, uh, one of the things that that always hit me hard with Malcolm was there was a period of time in which, um, you know, he would shun white help and he would say it's you know we can't do any you know you can't do anything for us until we can do something for ourselves and i understand that that is a journey that you got to go through is at first you do feel like you have to kind of do it internally because if we're together maybe we won't have all the problems that we have Um, but once you do stretch out that hand and you allow someone from a different community to come in and, and act as support what you're doing there is not only just supporting each other you're also 
unlearning the things that are keeping us separate. Right. And I'm not saying that I want us to be everybody mixed in the future or, you know, anything like that. But but taking down the borders, these imaginary lines that we've drawn, um, you don't unlearn that stuff if you stay in your echo chamber. So we have to have solidarity moments because we need to be or movements because we need to be able to unlearn what are the things that are that we've been taught to be against or be biased towards or whatever. So I need to always and you know what, I'll be honest, I'm uncomfortable around a predominantly white audience too. I'm uncomfortable in general around white people, even white people that I know well and like, because I'm waiting for a time in which white supremacy in their minds kicks in a little bit harder than their like of me. But I can't let that be the thing that governs my actions. I need to absolutely let the conversations go because they need to see me behave as much as I need to see them behave so that we can unlearn the things. So in terms of the future evolution of solidarity, it's really never stop trying to have solidarity. That is so real, by the way, what you just said about, you know, I'm waiting for their white supremacy in their mind to take over Mm -hmm. their to be I you said it much more eloquently than I'm gonna repeat it back but (laughs) that was that was so real and um I had I, I actually myself had a lot of moments where I was like questioning myself about like do I not like white people because you know I legit it's a question to ask it happens to me all the time I would find myself kind of making like come and like also I don't necessarily like, it's not like I do it on purpose, but most of my friends are BIPOC people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, just cause it's just like the similarities. And so sometimes it, it just happens like that, you know? And I've, I, I've had moments where, you know, I I'm like, Ooh, like maybe I should just like ease up on being like, yo, that's that white shit over there. Like we're making <laughs> white jokes or things like that. Um, but I also like had to have like a real combo with, it's okay about, to like, punch up though. <laughs> It's okay to punch up. Oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> never cross up. <laughs> Don't go down with a cross so you can push up. Sorry. That, that's true. But yeah, like the solidarity. And I think like to to something similar that I really like that you said is just like we always have to look for those moments of solidarity. And I think especially us BIPOC folks, like so many of our groups have the same issues the same as a result of what yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, if you go to protests, right. How, like I was at the stop Asian hate rally and, you know, we had some Latinx and black speakers get up too. And they were like, yeah, these particular issues that we, that the Asian community faces, like we also face these things too. And just in talking about all that, it's just like, all it is, is is just white supremacy and us scrapping to who see who's going to have the bottom spot on the totem pole. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Right. Well, and this that... is the... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, like, this is the, like, diabolical beauty and elegance of white supremacy, right? And it's similar to, like, organized religion and things like that, too, where it's... They sew it so well, so diabolically that you can't you don't even see how you're still being trained by them because they've already backed off. They 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 planted those seeds and they backed off. And we we've just performed whatever it is that they've taught us. And it's it's like I keep saying it's diabolical. It It's diabolical because it is so easy for for them to be removed from it um, that by the time we realize, oh, wait, you're oppressed too? And I'm fighting you and not the oppressor? By that time, we've done so much damage internally, it's hard for us to even work together. Like, this is what I'm talking about, like these invisible borders or everything like that. It's, they do the work so strongly that it takes you way too long to fix it, you know, to realize it before you can even start to fix it. Um, And so... I think it's taking every moment, like literally every time you see it as, as pain and ass as it is. And you got to be like, nope, stop. We're, <laughs> think about this. This thing happens to me. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, yeah, it's happened to you, too. Guess what? Guess what the common factor in is this? White supremacy. You know what, though? Also, a lot of times when people are talking about this, there's also very... Um, 
I'm trying to think of a word for it, but it's almost like exclusionary or like um, aggressive kind of language that's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular person who said a particular thing that's playing <laughs> in my head right now. But it's this means of saying, hey, white supremacy is the culprit, but it'll be like, yo, y'all Asians really bought into that model minority thing. And it's like yes. that really like finger yes. pointing. And it's like... So what are we what are we trying to accomplish here? Because what you just did, you assisted white society. Like you literally did the master's job and the master didn't even tell you what to do. You did it without being That's told to, so honey. That's so diabolical. It's so diabolical. <laughs> it's just in our heads. And, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's from a place of trauma as well, too, because I'm sure they're saying that because they, they have encountered and met and get a lot of comments from Asians who maybe really do, who do buy into the stuff yeah. or whatever it is. But there has to also be that understanding that that exists in every single group and that's not an excuse, but it's like, how do we invite in as opposed to just let's alienate this entire group all at once because, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And like when you, with that specific example you brought up, so like to me, that just reminds me so much about, again, the diabolical structure of privilege and how like even in those tiers, there's still like systems of trauma where like, if, if you've, you know, experienced or had a very specific Asian American experience, but you have the trauma of erasure, you have the trauma of being rendered invisible um, because of that colorist based privilege uh, within the structures and the totem poles. Well, I should say that checking myself for, for better language, hierarchies of, um, of racial privilege, you know, taking that and attacking someone who is considered lesser than, someone who is darker, someone who is black. Like that's also like, there are so many structures of trauma action and trauma-based responses. I'm just like, this is that's so a survival. frustrating. That's a survival it really is. thing it too. Because is. Is. You, if you even look at it in, in an animal form too, right? Like you, you can see that if you provide food to one and not to others, that you're developing that kind of a structure amongst them. Um, I think that the, that is is something that we just we react we respond to so well because our survival is um, that thing that's in our bodies that tells us to keep fighting to stay alive uh, come kicks in really hard there. Um, do you all agree that like God this sucks? Um, like how hard this <laughs> how hard it is to like actively change yourself? Like I I feel that that I wonder. I would love to see these moments. Like when I think of Yuri Kuchiyama, like I, I, there's early, there's an early spot in the book where she, where she describes herself as as American as they come, right? Um, you know, apple pie, you know, the whole, the whole thing, Sunday school teacher, whatever. And even as they're, they're incarcerating them, there's still always this question in her head of like, well, there's got to be a reason for it. Because you believe that the world is just like and and if you if the world is just, then this must mean we deserve this. Um, and so, like, even after going through that, like there's little doses of moments of radicalization, but it really, really wait. It, 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 it takes a while for it to manifest in her because she's got to undo so many years of believing the world is just and I'm a Japanese American and da 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 you know um, and I wonder too with Malcolm also going from the 12 years that he was in the nation of Islam how do you undo 12 years of that much indoctrination and some of it's self indoctrination right like he's speaking back into the echo chamber so to get to the point of actually sitting there and and of course this can a 100% be just a cinematic moment but in um in Spike Lee's Malcolm X, there's a moment in for Malcolm when he is doing his pilgrimage where he's sitting alongside uh, Muslims of all different colors and a white man hands him a cup to drink from and everybody's drinking from the same cup and it's it's part of, you know, whatever. And um, Malcolm sits there for a second as he stares at the cup, knowing that it's coming to him from a white person. And then he reluctantly, it feels reluctant, him reaching for the cup to grab it to take the drink. And it's an acting moment, of course, for Denzel. But I, I think it's what they were trying to tell is how difficult that must have been for someone who believes that every white person is a white devil. 
is sitting across some, you know, a white devil who believes the same thing that he believes and is offering him a drink. And he's everything in his body is telling him, don't trust that water. But he reaches for it anyway. And I think there's probably something like that that really happened for him, you know, apart from from that being from the movie of this thing of like, how do I go from all these years of not trusting white people, 38 years of my life to turning around and being like, okay, let's try. Like, I I guess I'm I don't know what I'm asking there. I guess I'm asking, like, you know, what is (laughs) I don't know what I'm asking. I'm asking something about how difficult it is to make those changes. (laughs) And I really think that those changes really are so gradual, you know, because I, 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 you know, I think as you grow and as you experience life, right, you garner enough different perspectives and different conversation and just different cultures and maybe you become more well-traveled or whatever it is. And you really just start to take in an understanding of other people and why they might have this perception and, and you, I guess with maturity, learn how to react to certain things differently. Or I think it's just like a time thing, right? Because, you know, when I was, when I was like a 17 um, and just really starting to get into un- trying to understand like activism and all these different things, like I had a much different outlook. I was probably a lot more raw. I mean, not to say that I'm not still kind of like that, but like, I definitely want to be, I focus on being accurate and punchy at the same time. Whereas before I was just like ready to just go, let me come out with this defensive energy. That's part of the journey. (laughs) You got to start out with anger. (laughs) It's all part of the journey. It's all part of the journey. Yeah. And I think that like, when you go through those different stages, you also just it's easy for you to also identify where people are in their stages too. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, I kind of look at people's responses and if they're like immediately defensive when you challenge them on something, I'm like, Oh, okay. So they're probably not ready. (laughs) Yeah. But but then it's easy to be like, okay, so I don't have to uh, like not discredit them. But like when I see, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to like bring up people that I don't like, but when I see certain people like doing that, out in the world for other people to see i just am like okay i know what that is um we had to switch from the sippy cup to the tea cup just now <laughs> i had to i was like i'm not gonna say anything but i'm, I'm gonna say something um th- yeah but it, no but, that's fair though yeah it's so fair it's so fair and like it's also like It's so great that you say that because one thing that we are definitely having to learn on the fly as we go is having compassion for these people. Like so many, so many of these organizers who have harmed me or have harmed, you know, other femmes or other trans folks in, in the work that we do. It's, it's like, you know, I still have to have radical compassion. Otherwise I am functioning that's still in an imitation of whiteness that's still an Mm. imitation of what white miseducation has taught me which is not to Mm. have compassion for human beings regardless of their mistakes you know so i just love that you brought that up so i'm just i'm just affirming i'm just affirming (laughs) with my teacup the title of our next podcast affirming yes <laughs> i love that well i also think it's cool to see like as you read about people that you really admire right like you can see where their life is marked by certain things mm-hmm. and i think what was a really cool thing and aided in Yuri's gradual, you know, change from being this colorblind patriot to um, a really, a true revolutionary nationalist, I think. Um, It was, you know, she just got life experience. She met different kinds of folks. She got involved in different things. I mean, her children would go down and help register black voters in Mississippi, like in the summertime and just like, you know, like her children became that way as well too, just from that influence. And, um, I think it's really cool to see that, like, as you continue to go on and have these experiences in life and the more you expand and really try to see other views, you can too be this kind of 
person, you know, you can still speak up and you can still understand and you can, you build that empathy within yourself. And I think that that, that is the biggest thing that these two people in particular uh, represent to me that, you, you know, you can always change and there's always, my therapist says I shouldn't use this word, but there's always redemption. <laughs> mm. um, Have um, they provided you with an alternative? I'm curious. Um, it was more like, it's from thinking about redemption in the terms of like, I've done something wrong that I need to be redeemed about mm-hmm. versus like you can have, you can just continue to learn and grow like and know that transform, it's all evolve. and know that it's all just part of the journey and what you're supposed to be on and that mm. n- and who you are is enough. It's that sort of uh, gotcha. kind of thinking. Yeah. Um, but I still like that word a lot, but you can still have it. Um, and I think it's really cool. And I think she really saw like the justice system, like, really fail um because you know she also became close with ram's other like uh um like ideological mentor uh robert f williams and he became known if you don't know about the kissing case in north carolina you can look that up it was in monroe north carolina you can look that up um uh, but basically, uh, he gained a lot of, you know, notoriety through his, um, defense against, uh, what had happened there. Um, but then he also, um, established like an all black NRA chapter, um, and he really preached self-defense and he actually was instrumental in getting, um, the Ku Klux Klan, um, bands like their caravans banned um through uh the black community in monroe as well too which was awesome but he linked up with her and um you know i think through her connections with these people and seeing like the work that they did and how impactful they were and really like she elevated that and amplified those voices and those stories and i think that that also aids you know the more you learn the more you transform all right yeah, actually, um, I think this is something and maybe this is a topic for the for us at another time is, um, you know, she did a lot of work for political prisoners specifically, which technically don't exist here in, in America because we don't do political prisoners. And yet here we go with a whole damn list that we can name of a whole bunch of political prisoners Um that like what's 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 strange work for you know a person to get into if they didn't have you know if they didn't believe that there was like it's not strange work for a person that was incarcerated in the internment camps to eventually get to but it is strange work for someone who starts out as a colorblind patriot as as asian self mentioned um that she was in the beginning um to go that far in your transformation from colorblind patriot to she's out there on these streets with these, you know, trying to free these political prisoners. Like that's a, that's a big trajectory for her to have gone through. And in really kind of in such a small time, a short time. And um, yeah, be- between, you know, incarceration to. Uh, well, what I really liked about her is she, she was very open to understanding people, even if she disagreed with them. And I think that that's a big thing. Like she became very deal. well-rounded because she was willing to talk to people and see, and even, um, uh, Williams, who I just brought up, he was a, he was about self-defense and like, we, we're going to meet violence with violence. Like we're not just going to take this lying down. And I think that that, that message, particularly from Malcolm and the people he inspired as well too, like Ram was directly inspired by his words and stuff. Um, people really turn that into just like, let me just attack anybody. And that's not what anybody was saying, but it's a very convenient way to flip the messaging saying like, you know, like, no one they were definitely against like outright attacking people like no one ever said that um it was about like i said meeting violence with violence like if the clan is going to be brutalizing us we will brutalize back is what basically they were saying um to kind of quote off of that a little bit so malcolm has a quote uh and i'm going to totally paraphrase it because i didn't write it down but it, 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 it you know he's got the reputation of being violent first but i think what's more accurate is he says something to the to the effect of if a dog is attacking you a two-legged dog or a four-legged dog do you let that dog continue to attack you or do you attack back and uh, so i think like when when especially when malcolm's being compared against um um, martin (laughs) you know you have full nonviolence and and to the point of like 
potential real harm for you. And then you got fighting back. And I think that the reputation that Malcolm had, the unfair, what I believe to be an unfair reputation that he had um, before he left the Nation of Islam, is that while he was talking about defense, he was getting the he was getting uh, people were framing it as is he's like, we're, we're just going to go out there and, and start hitting him first. And I don't think that was ever really his message. Now, in private, in a moment, might he do that? That's a different thing. But in terms of the movement, he was talking about two legged dog or four legged dog. If that dog's biting you, you bite back. And I think maybe Yuri took a little bit longer to to see that as a possible thing. But you you also probably have to see a lot of violence too until you get there, maybe. Um, you know, and and for me, I feel like it was always self defense over mm-hmm. laying down, which was something that I think is why Malcolm meant a lot to me mm-hmm. growing up. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you are open and willing and you get the full scope rather than a paraphrase or a misinterpretation or a purposeful misinterpretation um, with the intention of skewing a message, obviously you're going to be a lot more open. And I think that that really like can shift your opinion. That's exactly what we saw with Yudi. Um, And through her continued relationships with people who were inspired by Malcolm's words, I actually do want to read this quote from um, Robert F. Williams. Um, It was from his book, Negroes with Guns, um, where he clarified meeting violence with violence. Um, I do not advocate violence for its own sake or for the sake of reprisals against whites, nor am I against the passive resistance advocated by the Reverend Martin Luther King and others. My only difference with Dr. King is that I believe in flexibility in the freedom struggle. Struggle. This means I believe in nonviolent tactics where feasible and where there is a breakdown of the law, the individual citizen has a right to protect his person, his family, his home, and his property. When an oppressed people show a willingness to defend themselves, the enemy, who is a moral weakling and coward, is more willing to grant concessions and work for a respectable compromise. Psychologically, moreover, Racists consider themselves superior beings, and they are not willing to exchange their superior lives for our inferior ones. They are most vicious and violent when they can practice violence with impunity. And I think these kind of relationships and people who speak like that and can really articulate the full story of, and full scope of what they're saying, that's where transformation happens, you know, however fast or slow. Hey, oh, <laughs> my life. Amazing. Um, well, in that case, I would love to wrap up since we are a little over time. But I just want to, if there are any last thoughts from you two, I'd love to hear them before we uh, sign off. I just think the big theme of the conversation we had um, goes back to you can always learn and transform and be in a different spot on your journey with all of this and approach it from a place of empathy and be open to understanding other people's points of views and be open to having those conversations. But with that also comes a a need to understand like, you know, where you are in your journey and to be honest with yourself. And if you are that person who, you know, if you are against something or, you know, don't believe that racism is a thing or don't believe in these things, but when you're presented with um, a counter argument or a point to that, are you instantly defensive and really have no, no, no accuracy behind it or the facts or the truth? And, um, you know, making sure you do the work on your own. That way you're not having moments where you feel shamed or feel like you're being excluded or feel like you're not invited or feel like, you know, like I can't talk about this because no one understands me. Well, give you need to give yourself that knowledge and understanding first and then you also need to treat people with that same sort of respect and be willing if someone's if you want to come to the conversation come ready but also come open mm-hmm. right. sorry man um yeah to, ec- to echo that um being willing and able and able and open to to change and to growth like we should we should all know this without but some of us don't pay attention to it as much uh growth is uncomfortable and painful. Change is uncomfortable and painful. From the time that we're physically growing our bodies, we go through legit pain in doing that because change is difficult and it's violent in some cases. Um, For opinions, for beliefs, for um, 
values, these types of things are uncomfortable when you're going through it, but that is not a reason to stop. You know, we have to keep pushing through those moments. And if you're uncomfortable, it's probably because you're undoing something that makes you feel bad that you believed or you thought or, you know, and the work to get through it, to push through it is so important. Um, so, yes, being open to change, being willing to to listen, um, to not be the loudest voice in the room at all times is very important, but also embrace how difficult it is because it's it's a lot more. I don't know what the right word I want to say, um, meaningful, impressive to come through something difficult on the other side changed versus quitting in the middle and just giving up. Um, so if it's uncomfortable, that's okay. Keep pushing through it. <laughs> it's probably a good sign that it's uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. and, and in moments of solidarity and like trying to build that and understand other groups, especially when you don't always feel like your group is always heard or mm -hmm. taken seriously or anything like that, that uncomfortability is going to come through a lot and just, Lean on that. Don't run away from it. Facts. <laughs> and on that note, this concludes this uh, amazing, incredible panel talk, soon to be a podcast dropping May 19th on the joint birthdays of Yuriko Chiyama and Malcolm X. Uh, I will be having cake in the park, I believe. Nice. <laughs> I, like it. I don't know. Are y'all celebrating? Cake in the let's, park. Let's yes. that. Yeah. That's Can we please good. just like... I'll just like a video call all of you. Let's have cake in the Let's just have our <laughs> little cake and be like, yes. oh, happy birthday. Happy yeah, birthday. I love that. <laughs> it's also really dope that these two people share a birthday, even if it is four years apart, like I doing know. the work that they did and sharing a birthday. That's dope. I will say that I, I don't know about Malcolm, but I know Yuri really cherished that they had the same birthday. <laughs> she, she took did. it as a sign. Yeah. She was like a stan. She was a hardcore stan. <laughs> she, yeah, she loved hearing him talk. <laughs> she loved, yes, all of that. And, um, you know, uh, I'm, really jealous because i i wish i could <laughs> i would have loved to like be like friends with him like that and like he wrote her letters while he was abroad and all this stuff yeah. and so, like said she had a beautiful family and all this stuff and i was like oh my god i'm so jealous I'm and we didn't so even jealous. touch on the fact that she held his head at his in his last moments of his oh. life you know like yeah. she she there were shots flying across the the room and she ran up she and ran up and tried to cover him and she held his head in her lap and she kept saying, please, please stay alive. Please stay alive. So like she went to the end with it. Like, I mean, it wasn't her end, but she right put enough. her she put her body in front yeah. to a degree, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, and, and towards the end, she she was there. So yeah. um, I'm glad also you pointed like, that out. That's yes. You know. Also, how like that part of history has been so actively erased, mm -hmm. like even though like I I can't remember, there's so many photos I've seen where like, there's that one photo that originally of her holding him, but I've seen mm -hmm. her cropped out so many times. Seen I've seen it out, from yeah. the the angle where it's behind, so you can't see her face. Yeah, I'm just like, yo. Reenactments don't have her in it. You know, like Spike Lee's movie didn't have her in it. I was um, going to say, that's yeah it, yeah, it didn't have her in it there. Um, and I don't remember if Ali, sh I don't think Ali showed it either um because they also reenact his his burger there as well um but yeah i've never seen it reenacted accurately things to work on with all communities things to work on for sure that like, hashtag <laughs> things to work on uh, um, the list um, <laughs> and that being said thank you everyone for tuning in and we will see you next time thank you Charmaine. thank you Soph. and we're signing off right now Militantly Mix is a main hustle media podcast produced and hosted by me, Charmaine Fury. Music is by David Bogan, the one you can follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Militantly Mixed. If you'd like to become a sponsor of Militantly Mixed, please go to patreon.com slash Militantly Mixed for monthly sponsorship or paypal.me slash Militantly Mixed for a one-time only donation. And if you like what you hear on Militantly Mixed, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to be your mixed-ass self.
Main Hustle Media. Turn your side hustle into your main hustle.